Hi everybody and welcome to lesson 4.8, Solid and Hazardous Waste. The content in this video is aligned to the third edition of Environmental Science for AP and is associated with CED units 8.9 and 8.10. Here's our content objective for this lesson. Human activities, including the use of resources, have physical, chemical, and biological consequences for ecosystems. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to Describe solid waste generation. Describe solid waste disposal methods. Describe the effects of solid waste disposal methods. Identify categories of hazardous waste. Explain how hazardous waste is managed. Describe laws responsible for hazardous waste management. And describe changes to current practices that could reduce the amount of generated waste and their associated benefits and drawbacks. This is leading us to answering our guiding question. How should we manage human-generated waste? Waste in the way that we know it is a purely human-generated problem. The natural world, as we have learned, has a variety of processes to break down materials and to make use of their components, such as through nutrient cycling or soil formation. Humans, however, do not fit into that category. This is because we generate and dispose of waste in a linear fashion. Raw materials are extracted and used as inputs in a system of production, distribution, and consumption. Once the item is no longer useful, it is disposed of. This disposal leads to the problem we have now of a materials economy that is built on the ideas of consumer societies and planned obsolescence. Consumer societies are driven by the need to buy or own or use more resources, often in a pursuit of an unattainable ideal of happiness. This is further encouraged through planned obsolescence, where items are purposefully designed to be useful for a specific amount of time before they begin to break or slow down or be replaced by another newer version. Objects that used to be repairable have now been replaced with items that break after a few years, and it is often cheaper to buy a new one than get the old one replaced. Apple products, anyone? In the United States, we typically talk about waste in terms of municipal and industrial. Municipal solid waste, MSW, makes up only 3% of the annual waste production in the U.S., while the other 97% is industrial and heavy hazardous waste. We will begin with a discussion of MSW and finish up with specifics of hazardous waste. The larger pie chart, pie chart in the center of this slide shows the breakdown of MSW. As you look at these components, make note of the following. Approximately 62% of materials are potentially recyclable. Additionally, 34.3% is potentially compostable. The remaining 3.3 is highly likely to include household hazardous waste and e-waste. We'll take each of these larger categories in turn, discussing the ways in which they are disposed of as we go. Remember that over half of the waste generated in MSW is recycled. What does that mean? The first thing we should mention is that just because something is labeled as recyclable doesn't mean that it is or that it can be. Most of us are familiar with the recycling symbol and the number on the bottom or sides of plastic containers. Those numbers identify the type of plastic being used. It's important to note that not all recycling centers can recycle all types of plastic. So one should be aware of what is taken at your local recycling center. The question to ask yourself when it comes to recycling is whether or not something will be recycled, not can it be. On average, only types one and two are most commonly recycled, even though three through seven have a broader use and larger impact on the ecosystem. Now let's discuss types of recycling. There are two categories that we will follow. Closed loop, also known as primary recycling, and open loop, known as secondary recycling. Closed loop recycling is when the product is recycled back into the same thing, such as a plastic bottle into another plastic bottle. This retains much of the energy and raw material as there is no larger change in the material needed, just a little remanufacturing. Open loop recycling occurs when a product is envisioned as something else. For example, plastic bottles are processed to produce shirts, binders, and other items. In this case, the item is often of less quality, energy and material-wise at least, 
than if it had gone through closed loop recycling. While open loop can reduce the amount that goes into a landfill, closed loop is always preferred method of recycling. Speaking of recycling, I'm sure you've been told your entire life about the three R's, right? Reduce, reuse, recycle. Catchy slogan that has a decent meaning behind it. Waste management is the process of dealing with waste after it has been produced. The three R's seek to provide less waste to be managed during this end product phase. While reducing the amount you consume is great and reusing what you can is awesome, there is a fourth R that's a little harder to comply with in a consumer-based society. Refuse. One of the key ways to mitigating the human waste generation cycle is to refuse to use items that are unnecessary or have other more environmentally friendly versions. Let's take a moment and discuss the topic of greenwashing. Greenwashing occurs when companies and brands use purposefully misleading language and information to make their product seem more environmentally friendly than it actually is. Part of this is because it has become trendy to be environmentally friendly, and so companies reason they can charge more money for items that are marked in this way. It's the hallmark of our consumer society. We can buy our way out of the problem by using more sustainable materials, but this isn't the case at all. Very few regulations exist that define what sustainable, biodegradable, organic, cruelty-free, and non-toxic actually mean on the market. While companies will often avoid outright lying to consumers in greenwashing campaigns, they will often make use of the lack of scientific literacy and critical thinking in the populace by using buzzwords and vague statements that make them look much better than they actually are. Additionally, many companies will often do the bare minimum, such as stopping single-use plastic bags while still selling products that have more plastic packaging than they do item inside. Now remember that about 34% of MSW is considered compostable. This often comes from food waste and yard clippings, although untreated wood scraps can be included in this process. Composting uses natural processes of biological organisms, such as bacteria, insects, and worms, to break down organic material into rich soil. This process can be done on a single family or municipal scale, as long as the infrastructure is available. It's important to note that composting requires attention to agitation and moisture levels to ensure that the process remains aerobic and doesn't produce the foul odors associated with anaerobic methane production. And remember, if you're doing backyard composting, veggies are good, meat scraps are really bad. While the vast majority of MSW can be recycled or composted, 53% of MSW ends up in a landfill. What were once just large open pits and mounds of trash have become what are known as sanitary landfills. These structures are designed to reduce the amount of contaminants for tainted water and methane that are released into groundwater and the atmosphere. The key hallmarks of a sanitary landfill are triple, triple layered liners and a leachate collection system. The liners are made up of gravel, clay, and sand which are designed to reduce the amount of rainwater and other liquids that leach out of the waste. This fluid, known as leachate, is often collected in a system of pipes and is sent to a wastewater treatment plant for management. Once a landfill is full, it is capped with soil and covered with vegetation. A series of pipes can be inserted into the trash to collect the methane produced. This methane is often used to fuel other processes on the landfill site, or it can be added to another power generation station on the grid. It's important to note that landfills often have what is known as a tipping fee, meaning there is a cost to dumping in the location. These can range from anywhere from $50 to $150 per ton, and often provide incentives to municipalities to reduce the amount of waste that ends up in a landfill. Another method of solid waste disposal is incineration. In this process, waste is burned for the purpose of reducing its size and volume. The burning of waste produces multiple pollutants, some in the form of fly ash from chimneys and bottom ash as a byproduct of the waste itself. Fly ash can be reduced by running the air through a filter prior to release, and bottom ash often ends up in landfills. 
These waste products do not take into consideration the compounds that are released from the burning of the waste itself, as many materials have preservatives and other chemical compounds that produce toxic compounds when incinerated. An incineration plant can also be used as part of a cogeneration facility, where the heat generated from burning the waste is used to produce electricity. Let's talk about that remaining 3.3% of MSW and the majority of industrial waste. It's highly likely that this is hazardous waste, with a smaller percentage being e-waste. Hazardous waste is any liquid, solid, gas, or sludge material that is harmful to humans, ecosystems, or materials. There are four major categories of hazardous waste. Flammable, meaning it's ignitable. Corrosive, reactive, meaning it's volatile, and toxic. These are all chemicals and compounds that can be found in your home. I guarantee if you pause this video and go look, there are at least two separate categories of hazardous wastes in your homes right this second. It is important to note that these compounds should not go into the trash. Things like medication, motor oil, oil-based paint, cleaning solvents, and batteries should be taken to a hazardous waste disposal site, not your kitchen garbage can. Electronic waste, or e-waste, is often considered a hazardous waste because of the components found within the electronics. The components themselves are often precious metals or other compounds that are highly valuable. This means that the extraction of these materials from the waste is extremely important, although very dangerous. This extraction process often requires harsh chemicals and exposure to disease-causing solvents and other compounds. The majority of e-waste management takes place in countries like India and Bangladesh, where regulations of employee safety are much less stringent than they are in the United States. Workers are often exposed to harsh chemicals and unsafe working conditions without appropriate protective gear. In 2020 alone, 23% of global e-waste consisted of computers and smartphone components. Now, let's address the laws associated with hazardous waste. The first is the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, also known as RICRA. You could also call it the Cradle to Grave Act. The Resource Conservation and Recovery Act identifies hazardous wastes and provides guidelines for disposal. It also requires companies to be responsible for the impact of their products from the time it is produced to the time it is disposed of. It's important to note that this was passed in 1965 as part of another law, the Solid Waste Disposal Act. Next, you have the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, CERCLA, which we know as Superfund. Superfund was passed in 1980 as a response to the Love Canal tragedy. It requires the cleanup of hazardous sites by owners and provides compensation for those who were affected. If an offending party can't be found, this Superfund makes that cleanup possible. Superfund also manages what are called brownfields, which are contaminated industrial or commercial sites that require environmental cleanup before they can be redeveloped or used for something else. Lastly, let's end on the idea of an integrated waste management system. Like integrated pest management, this system seeks to use a variety of methods to reduce waste as well as the overall impact on the environment. The goal of an integrated waste management system is to invert the current method of waste management. The goal is to focus first on reducing the source of the waste, then increasing the capability of recycling and composting, investing in conversion technologies that make the waste less damaging, and to focus lastly on landfills. The goal is to disrupt the waste generation stream to produce less waste to begin with. In order to do this, we have to invest in more extensive environmental studies of products and an understanding of the cradle to grave life cycle of the products we use. The following slide provides you with an opportunity to see how some of these ideas are connected together. Feel free to pause the video and explore the connections between these topics. Then, use the statements at the beginning to review.